Okay, let's look at Romans chapter 1 before we go into Romans chapter 8. First, I want us to look at who this letter was written to. So, Romans chapter 1, um, in the first part, in verse 1, Paul's just introducing himself. And then he just kind of goes into theology here, uh, talking about um, the gospel of God that was promised. I think it's a very powerful theological statement of what the gospel is around the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his lordship. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I want us to look at verse 5. It starts to get into who the letter is addressed to. And it says, Through him we have received grace, and through Jesus Christ we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. So he himself has received grace and apostleship, and, and the purpose of that is to bring people um, to the obedience of the faith. Now, the faith is just a shorthand or a abbreviation for talking about Christianity. So, um, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So, so who's, it for, who's it written to? Um, those that will, are obedient to the faith, okay? Obedient to the, the Paul's apostleship, Paul's calling, Paul's grace is to bring people from among all nations to the obedience of the faith. Do you see that? Obedience to Christianity, obedience to the gospel. We could say it in many different ways, but just to obey the gospel or believe the gospel. Okay, and then look what he says further on, um, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So the people he's writing to are who? Uh, they are those that are obedient to the faith. They've been obedient to the faith. We have to see this from the outset to get an idea of what's being written in the book of Romans. It's very important we notice these little um, you could just pass it up if you weren't careful. But it's very important sometimes when we get into the theology of the, of the book of Romans that we notice these key little things. It'll help us to interpret a lot of what he's saying later, or it can get out of context. It could easily go off into outer space. When you, when you remove anything from, from the immediate context, it's, it, especially when it's difficult passages, it can very easily go into very speculative and philosophical terrain. And you can come up with all kinds of wild, wacky, and crazy false interpretations. We have to be very careful about that when we read these epistles. So it's written to um, there, those, uh, verse 6, the, whom you also, you are the called of Jesus Christ. Who are the called of Jesus Christ? Those that are obedient to the faith. Do you see that? Is that clear? Okay, and then look in verse um, 7, to all who are in Rome, so we know the location, beloved of God, uh, called saints, or, or called to be saints. They added those two words, called to be. The original is just called saints, because in the, in the New Testament, um, everybody took the name as a saint, a holy person, and uh, so they were saints. They were believers, okay? And then look in um, more context, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So we have to understand, these people are people of faith, okay? That's what's characterizing these people. And they are people that have been obedient to the gospel. The people he's writing to are people that have heard and believed the gospel. Is, it, is that clear? So this is written to the Roman believers that heard and believed the word of God. They're obedient to the faith. It's not written to sinners. It's not written to um, anybody else. It's written uh, to those that are obedient to the faith. I, I hope that's clear. So, called to be saints. Um, and um, so he goes into verse 8, you know, your, your faith. So what we need to notice here is, first of all, faith precedes everything else that follows. Faith precedes everything that comes after this. So just keep that in mind. Notice the order. Notice who he's talking to. Notice how he characterizes them. Notice how he speaks of them. They are people that have heard a message that Jesus Christ came. They heard it, and they responded by faith and obedience. And now let's go to chapter 8.
chapter 8, let's start in, um, we're just going to look at uh, verse 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I want us to notice right away, all things work together for good for who? For everybody? For pagans and Gentiles and Jews? and No, this verse is in the context of a certain type of person. Who is he writing to? He's writing to those that have believed the gospel. This preceded everything, okay? They, be- they heard a message, they believed it. So he's writing to those who, um, uh, well, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So let's ask a question. Who are those that are the called according to his purpose? We don't have to go too far in our minds to find out the answer. It's right there. The ones that are called according to his purpose are those that love God. Do you see the connection? It's the exact same group. It's the same people. So those who love God are those who are also the called according to his purpose. Who does God call according to his purpose? Those that love God. Those that love God are also known as those that are called according to his purpose. These are, it's important to see this in its context. It's important to see that there is something pre, um, that precedes what follows, okay? There's something that precedes it. And this is often what Calvinists miss when they read these verses. They always neglect, this, number one, the immediate context. Not always, I don't want to exaggerate the point, but they often neglect the immediate context and they often miss the words that precede the following passage. And so it distorts the picture and it distorts the context and it immediately goes into many theoretical speculative, philosophical realms, unnecessarily. So what we want to do is we want to ground everything to the word itself. We want to ground it with the word, with the context. We want to ground the verses in their immediate context. That will help us to not get carried away or get into philosophy that's not from the Bible, but it's actually from, probably from the, the um, from other outside religions that later people have brought into Christianity, but originally the early church never believed any of that stuff concerning like what we call determinism and how God arbitrarily chooses and does everything of his own accord with no necessary response on our own. That's not biblical Christianity, in fact. There's a lot of good Christians that believe that. Okay, I want to grant that. I'm not calling everybody that believes that like a heretic or a false teacher, but when we look at the scripture itself and when we look at early church history, nobody believed that at all. And I think from the scripture, we can clearly show that that's actually not what the Bible itself is teaching. So we know that, back to verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Remember, those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose, it's the same group of people. In the Old Testament, you'll often see, let's open um, Psalm 1, just to give an example. This is a very helpful key if you see it. Look at Psalm 1, verse um, 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, okay, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. What is he doing here? He's saying the same thing different ways. He's saying the same thing different ways. So often you'll find this in the Psalms, that they just, one verse says it like this, the next verse says it a different way, but they're actually saying almost identical same thing. Sometimes they add a little bit more to it, but generally they're repeating the exact same thing. And you will find that the New Testament does the same thing. Uh, It uses different terminology and different phrases, but it's often saying the same thing a different way. So so anyway, back to uh, chapter eight. Those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You see how it's the same group? It's not a different group. Same thing when we go to uh, chapter one, Romans chapter one, we see verse five, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. So, so Paul's called, he goes out that he might bring obedience to the faith among all nations and then among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So the called is the exact same group of the people that are obedient to the faith. Do you see that? He's saying the same thing a different way. He's addressing the same people, but he adds a little more 
maybe a little bit more um, flavor to it each time. That's generally what happens, and that's the way it works best. When you repeat the same thing, when you use a different phrase, it, it adds more color to the picture. You, you see what I'm saying? You don't have to, um, you're not necessarily talking about something totally different. Oftentimes you're saying the same thing, but you're using different terminology, or you use a different metaphor, uh, but it makes it more, more feng sheng. It makes it more like, um, I can't think of the word in English, but hopefully you know what that word means. <laughs> if not, Chinese 101 starting tomorrow at five. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, but, but you, are you following that? Okay, okay, so obedient to the faith, and then the called according to Christ Jesus, and then look in verse 7, beloved of God. That's all the same people, called to be saints. It's all the same people, all the same thing. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, yeah, anyway, so the Bible repeats itself using different words, and it often saying the exact same thing, and all, at the same time, it often adds a little bit more flavor to it. Yeah, but it's not going into a whole other realm necessarily. So, okay. So those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And what I'm saying is that that's the same group, the called according to his purpose, those that love God. Now, verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay? Who did he foreknow? Whom he foreknew? Context. Context is everything. Who did he foreknow? What has it already introduced? It's introduced people that love God. In the ver very first part of the of the book of Romans, Paul introduces those that have been obedient to the faith. He foreknows those that believe the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? He foreknows those that believe the gospel. That's, that's the context. I mean, that's what the, it says. That's the first chapter. It, what comes first? This is often where different theological systems will, will kind, of, <laughs> kind of miss the plot. I mean, they kind of like go way off track because they get the order wrong. I'll give an illustration. There is actually a, a group or a, the, a theological system that says you must be born again first and then and only then can you repent and believe the gospel. Born again first? That doesn't even make sense. Born again is the, being born again is the result of repenting and believing. If you repent and believe, you will be saved, right? Born again is the renewal of the Holy Spirit, the transforming of our heart, the, giving, the renewing of our minds. That doesn't come first. That comes second. But they get the order wrong because they have a philosophical system that men are so dead in sin, they can't respond to the gospel. Therefore, it must be that they're born again so that they can even respond to the gospel. Now... <laughs> It's logical, but it's not biblical. So the order is very important. The order of these events is very important. And this is why I'm pointing out these little key words that go throughout this entire context. And, and uh, I believe that they will root it in reality and not go off into speculative, philosophical, um, uh, theoretical ideas about the, predestiny, the predestination of God and all that sort of a thing, okay? So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, it's, this is not, these are not easy concepts to look at, so, but I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> okay, so are you guys following so far? Any questions yet? It would be better to get, if there's a question, to answer it, because otherwise it's clear. Yeah? Fungi, not so clear. <laughs> Okay, so Anyway, um so 
，是指什么人呢？爱神的人有一个前提。不是一个无条件的呃拣选，不是一个无条件的预定论，是有一个前提，爱神的人。就所以这书信一开始一开头就是在讲什么呢？听了福音，受了接受了福音的这些人，顺服了福音的人。所以我们谈接下来的这些呢，我们已经知道是有这样的一个前提。如果我们没有这样理解，我们很快就会。会开始啊、呃，钻牛角尖，想很多的，好像啊、呃，虚无缥缈的，呃，就是哲学的一些关于神的预定论啊，神的无条件的拣选这些东西了。实际上，我们要首先看，已经发生了什么事情。比如这个，这些人听了福音，信了福音，哈，这就是这个背景。呃，然后呢，保罗介绍接下来的呃，神的预知。之前他已经谈到神预知了谁，是爱神的人，这个是很重要的。所以，哦，对了，我还后来我也说，这个爱神的人也是跟这个第二组的人，就是呃，根据他的呃他的旨意，呃，那个蒙蒙召啊，中文是怎么读啊？二十啊？对。对对对 ，OK， 那这个被被召的人是谁？是爱神的人，是被召的，对不对？嗯、呃，我是在介绍，就是说这是同一组，对不对？还有呢，他是在讲同一个事情 ，OK。然后呢，我们读这个书信的时候，我们千万不要忘记这个上沙王，我们不要忘记他是写信给谁，还已经发生了什么样的事情，就是他们听了福音，信了福音。OK， 所以这个是会让我们，然后呢，我们就开始看到这个二十九，嗯 ，OK， 我会我开始用英文啊，现在更清楚一点吗 ？OK，OK，Thank、okay, okay, you，Praise God。OK， so for whom he foreknew， he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son， that he might be the firstborn among many。Brethren, who did he foreknow? He foreknows those that love God. So what I'm saying is this: the foreknowledge is not an arbitrary thing that's only based on the will of God. You can see that very clearly. The foreknowledge is it's a foreknowledge of a certain type of person. That's very clear. What type of person? Well, from the first chapter, those that heard the gospel and believed it, and from here, so it talks about those that loved God. So those that love God, so he foreknows those that love God. Do you see the context? Do you see the the connection? It's not arbitrary foreknowledge that God says this group will be saved and this group will be damned. That is not what Paul is teaching. So those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. What does it mean to predestine? It means that he pre. Determine the path for them. It so so the ones that love his son, the ones that respond to his son, the ones that he believes, they're predestined. They're now they're on course to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he's saying in this context of predestination. He's not saying that God arbitrarily predestined them for salvation while he left the rest、uh, over. He overpassed the rest and let them die in their sins. That's not what he's teaching at all. It's not even in the context. But rather, he's. He, I mean, you can when you look at these words and you see the order and you put it together, you can see.、Oh, okay, we're now rooting this in the scripture itself. We're not reading one verse whom he pre, whom he foreknew, he predestined, and now we're floating off into outer space with all sorts of theories and speculations about before the world how God decided I'm going to save this one and damn that one. That's. Do you see that that just came out of thin air? It's not even. It's not even according to the context itself. We have to stick with the scripture itself, or we're going to get off in all kinds of crazy things. So, so yeah. So whom he foreknew, who he foreknows those that believe the gospel. He foreknows those that love God, and that's the context. 
And that's what it clearly says. So um, let's not overlook that because the, the, Cal the Calvinist interpreters, they will want to automatically say, well, no, see, he foreknew and then he predestined. And, and auto but wait, no, but what does it say right before that? And how did the book start out? And who was he talking to? And you, you can't just jump at that point. You have to take the whole part or it's going to go off track really quickly and all sorts of speculation. Now, the most notorious chapter of the Bible for this is chapter nine because there it sounds really crazy. Like Paul's just really, it sounds like from, it, from a casual reading, it literally sounds like he's saying God's going to purposely harden this one and just to send them to hell. He's going to save these and it has nothing to do with anything people say or want or choose or decide. You have to read the full concept the whole context of chapter 9, 10 through 11, to see that's definitely not what he's talking about. It's impossible. It doesn't fit. If you only isolate certain passages out of chapter 9, it's going to look like that's what he's saying. It will definitely look like that's what he's saying. When I look at, even to this day, when I read over some of the, I just like, man, I don't really know how to make heads of tails of all this. But I know one thing. I've read the full chapter, and it's definitely not what he's saying. You can see from the, from the beginning of chapter 9 and the conclusion, it's definitely not it. That's clearly not, because if it, that's what he's saying, he completely contradicts himself. And I don't believe that Paul is a man that completely contradicts himself in the exact same passage. So, um, but yeah, that's how certain theological systems like Calvinism, they function, is they isolate the passage. And then they don't read the full context, and you can easily make those conclusions if you just look at that part and don't look at what, pre what precedes it. And that's what we want to do our best to avoid. Amen? Is that clear? Okay, so to predestinate um, is to predestine the destiny. Where are these guys going to go? That's what he did. He, he previously already set the course. He set the path. Where are they going to go? Where's our destiny? Our destiny is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. As far as the foreknowledge, let's look at another passage. I think it will help as well with this. In chapter 11, Romans chapter 11. Verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? See, we have to remember the whole context here is that the Jews did not believe the gospel, and it's shocking, and it's, it's almost impossible for them to accept. Okay, that's the context. That's the background to this section of Romans. Uh, and it, feel, it goes throughout the whole letter that it's the Jew-Gentile controversy or, or, or kind of like, um, I, I can't think of the word, but yeah, the Jew-Gentile, uh, what's that word? Uh, Zhongli, uh, tension. The, the, the Gentiles are believing and the Jews are not and they're rejecting and that's not how it was supposed to be according to how they understood the Old Testament prophecies. That was not how it was gonna be. So Paul's spending the, these, nine, these chapters 9, 10, and 11 to explain this question. So, so he says here in verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people, the Jews? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribes of Benjamin. Has God, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Who did he foreknow? Who did he foreknow? Let's read on. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone, alone am left, and they seek my life? But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God foreknew those that were faithful. Do you see that? God foreknew the faithful, the remnant. Those that did not bow the knee to Baal are the ones that God foreknew. For with God, there is no such thing as foreknowledge because he knows all things always, every, you know, without having to, he, there's no such thing with God as like knowing the future. So God knows, knows those that belong to him, and the, but God is not rejected. The point is, is that, no, God, has not, God rejects these hardened, unrepentant, unbelieving ones, but God does not reject the faithful. Those are the ones he foreknows. God foreknows the faithful. And I just want to prove that this is not a passage about what we call determinism. Determinism is this, so that Jelena can translate it correctly. When we say the word determinism, we mean that before 
time, God determined everything that was going to happen. And now everything is just God making it happen according to what he already planned. So in other words, we only think we have a choice, but we don't really have a choice because God already determined it. That's determinism. <笑>那麼快就翻譯了。<笑> 这个意思就是说但是有一些神水的体系基本上是接受了这样的一个说法就是加尔万主义改革宗的这个说法对但 um, I think I'm going to wait for Ben so I can... Oh, he's going to stay down there? Okay, he texted you or he telepathically communicated? Okay, okay Yeah, would Okay, so I was going to prove that this passage is not talking about determinism. And the way I'm going to do that is by looking at verse 22 through 23. This is one of the ways to interpret Paul when you get confused about some of his language. Look at the clear parts of what, of, of what he's saying and use them to interpret the obscure parts. Because sometimes Paul says things that are hard to understand. But when you read the fuller context, then you can interpret the difficult part with the clear part. Verse 22, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity. So he's talking about those that are cut off, those that are rejected. It's not God's fault, it's their fault, okay? That's the whole point. They're rejected not because God predetermined to reject them. They're rejected because of their hardness of heart and unrepentance, God did not create them for damnation. God did not create them to, ki- to send them to hell. That is not true. But rather, they are rejected and will be condemned to hell because of their hardness. So consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but on you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Notice it's conditional. Otherwise, listen, you have to continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Wait a minute. I've been grafted in, you say. Yes. But it's possible to be cut off. This is Paul's actual words. So you have to continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will be cut off like Israel was cut off for their wickedness, not by God's predetermined plan. They were not cut off by God's predetermined plan in the sense that God just wants to condemn them to hell. They were cut off by God's predetermined plan predetermined plan because he predetermined to cut off the hard-hearted wicked ones. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and then in verse 23, and also, they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Wait, I thought God rejected them. I thought God arbitrarily decided to send them to hell. No, that's not what the scripture teaches. In fact, the Israel who's been hardened, who have they been hardened by? They first hardened their own hearts and then God hardened them as well. But it was not God arbitrarily saying, I'm going to harden this one and I'm going to save this one. That's not what he's teaching. He's actually saying that there's hope for these hardened Jews. They can still be saved. He actually literally says that. And those that have already been saved, they can be fallen. They can fall. They can be lost. And these that are hardened, they can still be saved. So what we're saying is that Paul is introducing the idea that this thing is static. This thing is not set in stone. 
It's not predetermined, and now God is only working out his plan of how everything's going to happen. But how we respond is determining these things. Does God not foreknow? Yes, God foreknows. He foreknows those that repent and obey. He foreknows those and predestines those that, that repent and obey to be conformed to the image of his Son. But if they're predestined, that means it will absolutely happen. No, that's not necessarily the case. It's possible to start the race and half and fit and um and bond to our faith and to just run halfway and then and give up. Just like it's possible to like not start the race and be rejected, but later enter in the race and win. So the Gentiles who are now being saved, they cannot look and say, see, God saved me so I don't have to worry about everything. Everything's fine. That's why he gives this warning. No, that's not how it works. It's, you know, God saved you and his, his goodness and his mercy. But if you don't keep following, you'll be cut off like the Jews were cut off. It's not because God saved you. You don't have to worry about anything. That's not what he teaches. God saves us by his goodness and his mercy, but we do have to run the race. We do have to fight the fight. We do have to finish the course. Why? What what will happen if we don't? Well, he tells us. Otherwise, you will be cut off. And them, but they're the the reprobate. They're rejected by God. God's not going to save them. God already determined before he created the world to send them to hell. No, that's not what he says. Look at what he says in plain ink, black and white. And they also, referring to the hardened, rejected, judged Jews, they also... If they do not continue in unbelief, in other words, if they repent of their unbelief in Christ, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in. So it's not determined already how it's going to be. It is not. It's known. God knows the final ending. He knows the beginning from the end. But it's not determined arbitrarily by God who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That is a complete distortion of the truth. It is not biblical teaching. What's determined by God who's going to go to heaven and go to hell are those that harden their hearts are determined to go to hell. Those that reject the gospel are predestined to go to hell. Do you see the difference? But that's according to their response to the word of God. It's according to their own acts, their own behavior. It's not according to God's good pleasure like, I, I want to save this one, but I want to condemn this one to hell. That's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what it teaches. But rather... God foreknows those that, that are obedient to the faith. God foreknows those that love God. And these are the called according to his purpose. And these are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So pre, foreknowledge comes first. Predestination comes second. So in other words, God knows all this stuff first. And then he predestines. There's a term in theological circles called double predestination. This means that God has predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. Double predestination. So there's two destinations. But the meaning of that is, is, is very, very bad. It means that God of his own will wants certain people to be condemned to hell forever and he wants others to inherit eternal life forever. And, and that, I think, is wicked. I think it's wrong. I think it's totally false. I think it's a false teaching. I don't think the Bible sustains it at all. Um, but if we look at it like this, there is a double predestination in the sense of this. The righteous are predestined to eternal life and the wicked are predestined to eternal destruction. That's true. God has set the course. He has set the destination. If you're on the path of wickedness, then you're going to end up in eternal damnation. The course is already set. But it's not set in a sense that I choose this one for salvation and this one to walk the path of destruction because I want to send him to hell. No, not like that. But the paths are, the paths are already set. The path of righteousness is set to eternal life. Let me just prove this in Romans, uh, the earlier chapters, like chapter 2. We can see very clearly that Paul sets this out in the very outset of his letter. Let's look at um, chapter 2, verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath 
in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. There's two paths set out very clearly here in the very beginning of the book. The path of wickedness, rejecting the gospel. If you're a Jew, not believing in your own Messiah, etc., then you are set for absolute destruction. You are predestined to absolute destruction because the path that you're on, that's where it heads. It's predestined to end in the lake of fire. On the other hand, if you're on the path of righteousness, then you are predestined for everlasting life because that path leads to everlasting life. And that's why Paul introduces those con- those conditions. Make sure you continue or you'll also be cut off because the path, the, the idea of, of predestination is not an arbitrary selection that absolutely, the end is absolutely determined already. But it's, the course is set, but there is a, a part that we have to play where we decide to walk on it and then we must be faithful until the end. And the same way he says, you, be, you could be cut off, that they can be grafted in, even though they're on the path now to the lake of fire, but it's not too late. It's not impossible that they would turn and repent and be grafted in again. This is the exact same teaching of the Old Testament. If we look at Ezekiel, um, should be chapter, I think it's chapter 18. Yeah, chapter 18, verse, let's look at verse 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all? that the wicked should die, says the Lord, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Look at this, though. But when a righteous man a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. Do you see that? It's the exact same teaching out of Romans. It's just reversed in the order. First, he talks about the wicked man being saved, and then he talks about the righteous man being lost. But in, in, in Romans, he says, now, he says that you, the righteous, could be lost if you don't stay, you know, if you don't stay faithful. And then the, the wicked, he can be grafted in again. It's the exact same teaching. Exact same teaching. This is predestination, at least in this context. And I want us to look at another verse in Romans. Let me go back to Romans chapter 8. Because we want to end this section. Uh, I mean, I want to show how he ends this section. Look at verse 37. This is a powerful and awesome verse. All of these are. Um, Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded... Now, before we move on, let us focus on this word that I am persuaded. Persuaded of what? Convinced of what? See, I want to say this, because later on it says, he goes on and he says that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. People use this to teach that once you're genuinely saved, it's impossible that you could ever turn away from your salvation. That's what they use it to teach. Is that what he's actually saying, though? Look at this verse, I am persuaded. Listen, if If that's what Paul was saying, if he was teaching divine determinism, in other words, that since God has saved us, absolutely no matter what, you will definitely be saved. There's no possibility that you could fall away. There's no no necessity that you uh, have to focus to endure till the end because God's going to make it happen regardless. 
Why would he use that word, I'm persuaded? Being persuaded is something at the, at the outset you weren't not fully convinced of, but you've become convinced of it. If Paul was teaching divine determinism here, he would say it's impossible for anything to cause us to lose our salvation because this is the doctrine of, of divine determinism. This is what it means. You know, he would not use this language. He would not use this language. He's come to a deep conviction of the sustaining, keeping power of God. In every circumstance of life, no matter what it is, the power of God is greater to help us and to keep us that we may overcome. But that's, this, that's one thing. It's another thing to say that this verse is teaching no matter what, you will never lose your salvation no matter what happens. It's impossible because divine determinism, God has already said it, it's going to happen no matter what. No, that's a whole different issue. That's a whole different aspect. That's a whole different thing. That's not what he's saying. If he was saying that, I am convinced, I am persuaded, he would never use the word I am persuaded. If that's really what he intended to communicate here, I am persuaded that Paul would never say, I am persuaded. But he would use another word. He would use something more emphatic. He would use something more absolute. He, you know, I mean, I don't see Paul using this sort of a language here. I'm persuaded that Jesus died for our sins. I mean, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see that he uses a term like that in that context. I'm persuaded that Jesus is the Lord. Maybe, I don't know. But I, I don't believe that this is the right wording for such a thing. So I look at this that um, I'm persuaded is something that it's indic indicative of He's talking about a deep conviction that he's come experientially to realize that, that, yeah, God is able to keep us in any and every circumstance. No matter what, we never have to backslide. We never have to fall away. We never have to be overcome by darkness. We never have to be overcome by the evil one. That's one thing to say that. It's a whole nother thing to read into it um, what we call divine determinism and say, see, this proves that no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Once you've genuinely be saved, it's impossible that you would turn away from the faith. Because if that was a true, if it was true, then he wouldn't use all those other uh, conditional phrases, say, so if you continue, if you, you know what I'm saying? It, there's no need to introduce those at all if he's teaching divine determinism.